Geopolitics.com, and his latest book is called The Dimensional Ecology of the Omniverse, and I'm psyched to have him here. Alfred, welcome to THC. How are you? Well, thank you. I, I'm very happy to be here, especially to be talking about the dimensional ecology. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a real interesting subject, and this is a serious pleasure. You've got a really long list of impressive credentials, and it's great to see someone with such a prestigious background examining not only the stranger aspects of our reality, consciousness and the ET presence, but also like the secret programs and dark agendas of the global elite. And even though these things are getting harder to deny a lot of the leading scientists and scholars are still unwilling to explore them but i mean being on the front lines yourself do you see that tide turning at all well yes and there's a scientific reason for it that grows out of the dimensional ecology itself and that is what we call the positive timeline and the positive future and people can go to a website that we've set up for this purpose called positivefuture.info and there there's an equation that we've developed called positive future equals positive timeline plus unity consciousness and that's an actual equation that there's plenty of empirical data that supports that equation all sides of it and basically what we discovered was that after uh, December 21st, 2012, the timeline, basically the time-space hologram that we're in now, that is, we earthling humans are in, is composed of multiple timelines. And as of December 21st, 2012, some people say it was in October uh, 2011, we shifted onto a positive timeline. It, it kind of was going there for a while. And we shifted off of what had been foreseen as a catastrophic timeline. There, there were several predictions, and we can get into those if you want, mm -hmm. of catastrophes on Earth, things like global coastal events, which are tsunamis hitting all of the coast, destroying all of the coastal cities. It's, it's like the KT event that knocked out all of the dinosaurs mm -hmm. 65 million years ago. Well, that didn't happen because we shifted timelines. And so all of a sudden, these things that hermeneuticists, which are decoders of prophecy, said, oh, this is going to happen in 2013. And there were various remote viewing studies, and even time travel probes that said we're going to happen in 2013 didn't happen. They had happened in adjacent timelines or dimensions, but not in the one that we're on. Interesting. Yeah. And it's because the interdimensional portal of the universe that we're in, we're, we're in a multiverse that is composed of multiple universes, a humongous number of universes. And the interdimensional portal in our universe started uh, broadcasting permanently waves of unity consciousness. And unity consciousness says we are one. It's not like duality consciousness, which is I win, you lose. Right. And uh, that's how you create a positive future is by being on a positive timeline and being able to tune into the unity consciousness that is there. So that's the story of, of why we're on a positive timeline. That's interesting, man. Well, let me ask you, was this shift natural? Because I know obviously the date has been prophesized for some time, but we also hear that in these black budget projects, they're messing around with timelines also, or at least trying to. So what do you see as being the catalyst for this shift? Is it a natural cycle in the universe or was this more of a man-made alteration? Well, I, I think that there were a lot of, quote, men, <laughs> that is, consciousnesses, which were embedded in and committed to duality consciousness, I win, you lose, whether they were, you know, working for money or they were working for the matrix part of the Illuminati, part of whatever faction, you know, banking, war faction, or they were working for one of the negative ET factions, 
or they were working for one of the diabolical factions, or they were just confused. And they may have been involved in promoting a negative timeline or in projects that that are still trying to promote the negative timeline, you know, using exotic weapons like HARP to make us believe that, oh, we're on the edge of the end of the world, but it's all fakery. Right. So, okay. So you think that it's media manipulation because I was going to say, if we were on a positive timeline, I would hope that it would be a lot more positive than the reality we have. There's still a lot of suffering to go around. Yes, but it's all manipulated. That is, all of the, quote, wars that we're in are actually false flags. Mm -hmm. War is an industrial activity. It's like making shoes. And the people who are in the war industry actually do so to make money, and they do it by controlling both ends of the war. That is, they control all parties in the war, either by funding all parties or by arming them or by manipulating them. And that's how they control the money, by arming them, by getting the territories. Even the so-called Cold War between Russia and the U.S. was a sham because Russia and the U.S. used to meet once a year under the North Pole in a submarine to plan out the next year. It was like controlling market share. Mm -hmm. How many ICBMs are you going to build, da, 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 so that the charade can go on. <laughs> yeah, and to make it even weirder, the reality we're in itself seems to be just holographic. So that's another layer of, is it even real? Yeah, yeah. And the entire time-space hologram that we're in is actually an intelligently constructed reality. It's like we're in a super carnival ride. We're, we're like in an e-ride at, at a cosmic Disneyland. And we, our souls incarnate into it. And actually, our souls are holographic fragments of source, of God. And that's one of the scientific discoveries that we've explained in the dimensional ecology of the omniverse. Now, what's true is that the fundamental property of a hologram is that the whole is contained in each part of the whole so that our souls, which are holographic fragments of God thus are God. So each of us is God in a very real sense. And as we discovered in exploring the different parts of the dimensional ecology, the intelligent civilization of souls actually all collectively participate in building the universe that we're in and all of the universes that we know as the multiverse. That's how, what we spend most of our time doing is building and creating the multiverse as part of God. Wow, man. Well, you're right. It does seem like folks in the forefront of science today are confirming a lot of the ideas that spiritual gurus of the East have been saying for centuries. And it's fascinating to see that happening. But this new model of the omniverse, to reiterate your equation, I believe it's the multiverse plus the non-physical spiritual dimension consisting of the civilization of souls plus source itself, right? That is the structure of everything that is the way you see it, correct? Yes. This is an equation that we came to. And part of the original science that is developed in the book around a new concept, a new scientific concept called the omniverse that we are bringing forward. Right now, the canon of science, modern canonical science, the farthest that it will go is the multiverse, which novelist William James and philosopher, psychologist developed in the latter part of the 19th century. And the definition of the multiverse is the totality of the universes of space, time, energy, and matter. And that is as far as modern canonical science will go. They do not recognize anything that is beyond time, space, energy, and matter, such that modern canonical science will not recognize the scientific validity 
of the human afterlife, of the intelligent civilization of souls, of spiritual beings, or of God, because modern science considers that those cannot be proven scientifically, and therefore those concepts are matters of faith and belief and not scientific issues. And mm -hmm. what we demonstrated in the Dimensional Ecology of the Omniverse was just the opposite, and that using replicable scientific evidence, using the scientific method of standard protocols and replicable results, we can prove the existence of the intelligent civilization of souls, of the dimension of the afterlife, of the um, spiritual beings of God, and even of the formula of the omniverse. And the dimensional ecology equations are the omniverse equals the multiverse plus the spiritual dimensions. Now, that's a formula that has never been stated before. And basically, the multiverse equals all the universes of space, time, energy, and matter. That's as far as string theory and, you know, bubble universe theory and as a modern science will go. And that's all that can be taught under the modern canon of science. And that's all that can be taught at universities. And I say that because I presented a curriculum to university departments here in British Columbia at the uh, head of department level. And they said, Alfred, you're 10 years ahead of your time. And I could see that all I was looking at was their fears, not the scientific validity of their decisions. And in fact, under this formula, spiritual dimensions equals the intelligent civilization of souls plus the spiritual beings plus source or God. So again, the omniverse equals the multiverse plus the spiritual dimensions. And once we, once we understand that the afterlife is an energy dimension on the same order as the space-time hologram that we live in, except that we were involved in creating the multiverse, then it becomes very easy to understand this. Yeah, man, that's pretty impressive. And you're so right, because some of these cutting edge scientific experiments are confirming the idea of a life for consciousness outside of the body or a concept of a spiritual plane, but they don't have a model to turn to that includes those new areas. And that's sort of what you've done for them in this book. But one aspect that's hazy for me, and I was really anxious to ask you about this, and that's travel between parallel realities and the spiritual dimension because we hear that extraterrestrial intelligences and black ops military projects are able to jump dimensions and access other timelines but can they also access the spiritual dimension as well that seems a little bit weird for me because it's non-physical i guess a better question would be is there a different method of travel to go from a physical reality to a non-physical plane or jumping from one physical 3d reality to another or do we even know that's a key uh a key question, and that was one of the questions that I really had to examine when I started writing this book, which was I was uh, doing a book tour, my first book, Exopolitics, in Spain in, in 2009 as part of the European Exopolitics Summit. And uh, I was being interviewed by this Spanish journalist in Barcelona for the second largest newspaper in Spain uh, for its kind of back page feature. And the interviewer, Ima Sanchez, asked me a very profound question. She said, Alfred, tell me how the universe works. What's the relation between extraterrestrials and reincarnation? Wow, I really got to work on that. And to answer a question, it took me five years. And this book was really the answer to her. And what I found in the course of my research is that Two technologies are really common and key to the omniverse, both the spiritual dimensions and the what I call exopolitical dimensions or the multiverse. And those are telepathy and teleportation or time travel. 
telepathy is non-local mind-to-mind communication. And teleportation is displacement between points in a single dimension or between points among several dimensions along a single timeline. And time travel is displacement across several timelines. And what I found is that teleportation and telepathy are used by entities both in the universes of the multiverse and in the spiritual dimensions, in the afterlife and in the spiritual dimensions itself. For example, extraterrestrials are basically incarnated souls in some universe, on some planet or dimension of the multiverse. And extraterrestrials will use to get around in a universe or in the multiverse, they will use teleportation. So we have photographs of uh, extraterrestrial craft creating their own wormholes and teleporting from one dimension into our 3D time space dimension. Mm -hmm. And we have multiple reports of abductees uh, being or contactees being teleported up into hyperdimensional extraterrestrial spacecraft and telepathy. We have multiple reports. Well, first of all, Professor J.B. Ryan at Duke, at, at Duke University has studied and in parapsychology, there's a whole study of how telepathy is a property of the earthling human mind. And if you go to contactee reports and abductee reports, telepathy is how extraterrestrials communicate with humans and among themselves. That's how advanced intelligence communicates in the universes of the multiverse. And likewise, say when a soul is getting ready to incarnate into a body in some universe or solar system or planet of the multiverse, say the data shows that the soul, when it's ready, will enter through the interdimensional portal between the afterlife and this particular universe, let's say, if it's going to incarnate on Earth, and it will teleport right up to the time-space coordinates of the mother, right up next to the fetus in the womb, about three months prior to birth, and then it will integrate itself into the fetus. Hmm. And uh, three months later, it'll be born. And likewise, when the soul goes to leave the body upon bodily death, the soul will leave the body and then teleport toward the interdimensional portal, which in near-death experiences and in all of the contacts through near-death experiences or through mediumistic experiences or through hypnotic regressions of soul memories of the interlife will leave through the interdimensional portal between our earth time space hologram and the dimension of the afterlife or the interlife. So mm -hmm. uh, teleportation and time travel or telepathy are the common modality among the dimensional ecology within the universes of the multiverse and also between the universes of the multiverse and the dimensional ecology of the spiritual dimensions, which include the afterlife, the spiritual dimensions, and God. It's actually very simple. There's a lot of mystery that surrounds it, which has been actually injected there, whether on purpose or not, by mainly over the last five thousand three to five thousand years by the human religions. And that's what this book really kind of discovered. Because it went in and began to explore, well, what's the science behind all this? And we compared it to the, the quote, text, quote, sacred text of the religions, what each believed about what happens after death and the soul and all of that. And various religions have been teaching a Tower of Babel that doesn't correspond to scientifically what actually happens at all. And that's why 
earth is, is mired in this Tower, tower of Babel confusion. It's mainly due to the religions. Mm -hmm. And a good deal as to why we have such a world of war, disease, crime, and poverty and ignorance can be laid at the feet of not only the religions and those who manipulate it, but to the elites who have, from behind the scenes, manipulated this ignorance, and those negative interdimensional forces who manipulate the dimensional ecology, such as to prey on this ignorance. In my humble opinion, of course. <laughs> yeah, man, this is fascinating stuff. And another question about this. In the book, you say that time travel and teleportation can occur both through man-made portals, but also natural stargates. Can you give us an example or some background on natural stargates on the planet? Where have these occurred? Are these like physical locations? Yes, yes. And um, I, I can give you some some examples there's a colleague of mine named Jerry Wills. You you may have heard of him. Mm -hmm. He is actually, and and I've done a a program with him. You can go to Exopolitics TV on this, and he's actually an extraterrestrial who was left here at birth. He's from the planet Tau Ceti, and or, or from the solar system Tau Tau Ceti. Wow, and he he was left here at birth as a project of the Council of World. It's kind of a Superman story. And he leads expeditions and has been down to South America. And he has gone into portals where he has actually teleported inside the portals and has come out. So he's can has it actually experienced these portals. I have a another colleague who's the head of UFO DC, and his name is Wilbur Allen. And again, you can go to exopolitics.com and see a number of our interviews there. And he he's extraordinary because he he has had a career on Air Force One under a number of presidents. And now he's a photographer in Washington, D.C. And the extraterrestrials will direct him as to where they will be. So he will be at a particular spot so that he can photograph them as they come in to land in the protected airspace over the U.S. Capitol and the White House. And there are a whole number of his, of his photographs. You can see them at exopolitics.com or at his website, UFODC.com. And so there was one photograph that he he explained to me that he was photographing a gray extraterrestrial that was swimming in the reflecting pool down across from the Capitol. And at the same time, at the opposite end of the reflecting pool, a group of Mayan Mayans in classical garb, they were classical garb Mayans, landed and appeared at the end of the reflecting pool. And the Mayans, it was explained to me by a colleague, her name is Marisol. Uh, we, we spoke together at a conference in Mallorca, Spain, and she's a student of the Mayans. And what the Mayans did is that they they bound their skulls in a way so that their third eye would be maximized. They they constricted the, the bones of the skull. And that is because they practice natural time travel and teleportation through portals. Wow. And that's why they think one of the theories that the Mayans disappeared all of a sudden, this very advanced society, and that is that they teleported en masse to another dimension. <laughs> you know, they, they didn't yeah. go there. They just teleported there through, through natural stargates. And so that one theory that Will Allen has for the fact that in this one 
photograph, he has a gray swimming in the swimming pool and this group of Mayan elders in the classical garb that is from six or seven hundred to a thousand years ago was that they had time traveled from their time space to our time space, that is the United States capital, one of the three nations, you know, city-state capitals of Rome, London, Washington, D.C., of the Western Empire, uh, and had been there in that photograph at that moment. So that's an example of the natural stargates. And there are others who state that if you look at certain paintings and depictions, for example, of Jesus, that he's depicted in his resurrected state as actually using natural stargates for travel. Hmm. And that he has sort of a, an expanded aura, you know, that's depicted behind him. Right. And that they're actually depicting a natural stargate at that point. Wow, that is pretty interesting. Yeah. So the Oxford University Press, they approached you to write a book that applied the principles of international law to extend out to include extraterrestrial contact. And I thought that was pretty noteworthy to have such scholarly, fundamental work done on a topic such as this. And coming from one of the mainstream universities, I can't help but wonder if this is groundwork for some type of disclosure. Do you get the vibe that this is eventually going to roll, roll out in a mainstream way or not? Well, I, I certainly hope so. And a lot of it came out from that initial contact with, with Oxford. And from there, I was able to develop what's called the dimension-based typology of extraterrestrial intelligent civilizations. Because in order to write the book, when I first sat down to write the book on extraterrestrials, and the law, I said, well, first of all, we have to have a typology of extraterrestrial intelligent civilizations in the multiverse, because law and legal terms rely on precision in definition and location. If you can acquire jurisdiction over an entity, you have to be able to describe that entity. And if that entity is not in your reality, and if you have no power to, to have that entity in your reality, how can you talk about having jurisdiction over them? Absolutely. And, and so uh, I looked around and there was the Kardashev scale, which had been developed by a Russian uh, scientist named Kardashev and had been popularized by Mishukaku. And that was where you have, say, a zero type civilization. It, it was based on the type of energy that a civilization produces. Right. It, you know, whether they're using their own nest uh, or whether they're using the power of the universe or whether they're dealing at a galactic level or at a universe level. Uh, zero, one, two, three. And we, of course, at, are at a zero type universe trying to become a one type. And I didn't think that was quite adequate. And there was another typology, which is based on, is the intelligent civilization cooperating with the U.S. national security complex? And hey, the U.S. national security complex is just one nation on one planet in one solar system in one galaxy, in one universe in which one German supercomputer simulation estimates that there are 500 billion galaxies in our universe alone. <laughs> so I said, that's not very good. So I ended up saying, well, what do the extraterrestrials, what do the intelligent civilizations say about themselves? And they describe themselves as being dimension-based or density-based. In other words, that's the most fundamental way that intelligent civilizations self-describe themselves. They'll say, 
I'm a Pleiadian from the fifth dimension, or I'm an Arcturian from the sixth density. That density is has a little more nuance or connotation than dimension does. It means it's more about consciousness. And densities and dimensions are about discrete bands of consciousness energy. And, and so I came up with the, we were able to develop the dimension-based typology of intelligent civilizations in the multiverse that started with the time space dimension solar system civilizations of which earth humanity is one earthling humans are one we're one and in our solar system there's another time space third dimension third density human civilization as well as an insectoid as well as an intelligent reptilian civilization and that's on our nearest planetary neighbor uh mars right so yeah this is really what i wanted to get into this eco typology of all the different beings and intelligent civilizations that we know about so far and like you mentioned one might define themselves as a fifth dimensional Pleiadian. When someone describes themselves as uh, other something other than a third dimension or a fourth or fifth dimensional being something higher, is that no longer uh, a physical reality or is that because that's, you know, would just be three dimensions. So is a fifth dimensional Pleiadian not necessarily from a physical plane? Well, it would be a physical plane. It's just a different kind of matter. You know, here are principal dimension aside from space is time right there in the fifth dimension a principal dimension might be light hmm wow yeah or love mm -hmm. interesting to try to figure out what that would be like yeah so it, it's very difficult for our minds to completely comprehend that right because we are so used to time space and we are inside of a primate body. So we are living a primate reality in time space. However, through meditation, one can start reaching into fourth dimensional and fifth dimensional realities, beginning to incorporate more of their uh, concepts into our reality and we know that we're going through what's called a planetary ascension at this time or that is not everyone that we share our time space hologram with is at third dimension or third density you know some will be at 3.2 others will be at 3.5 others will be at 3.8 mm -hmm. and be because we're all have a discrete energy signature and we're all at a slightly different place along a consciousness evolutionary scale and the purpose of this time space hologram is actually soul development to aid in our soul evolution so some of us are at a certain way along in soul development other further down but this this machine puts us all kind of in the same chamber although we're not it looks like we're sharing the same planet but we're actually not in some in some ways there's a lot of what's called stratification going on interesting like it's a it's a way more positive experience for some people who have a way more positive viewpoint of it and some some other people view this planet as a, almost a physical hell they're going through life hating every moment is that kind of what we're talking about in their levels of consciousness well that that could be yes uh, uh again going back to the formula positive timeline equals excuse me positive future equals positive timeline plus unity consciousness and what that means if, if one focuses on the positive timeline is given is pretty much a given. That's the timeline mm -hmm. that that we're on. We we have very very little control over the timeline itself. However, over unity consciousness, 
those are waves of unity consciousness that are being broadcast into our hologram. And our minds are like radio receivers. And to the extent that our minds can open themselves to the to the field, to the morphic field that exists, and we pick up these broadcasts, then that's that's the extent that we can, you know, this is actually paradise on earth if we were in a state of unity consciousness of the full blast. <laughs> right? But to the extent that we can full, you know, to the fullest extent possible receive this unity consciousness, then we're experiencing the maximal of a positive future. People who are into unit, into duality consciousness of I win, you lose, well, they're turning this energy, it's actually turning it against themselves, you know, where they're trying to, let me see how, how I can use these explosives, use do some propaganda against this group and blow this group up, you know, which a large part of the world is into that activity right now that we call war or subversion or exploitation or something, that doesn't work out. <laughs> right. And you mentioned a little bit ago the typology that was inadequate, that was too limiting for mapping intelligences uh, based on whether or not these species were cooperating with the military, industrial, extraterrestrial complex. And I do think that's interesting. What types of beings or species do we know are cooperating with the earthly governments? Right now, just to give a rough ballpark figure, number one, the question you ask, the answer is highly classified. <laughs> number two, there are 150 known. This gets us into the subject of exophenotypes, which are which is defined as the physical characteristics of extraterrestrials based on their physical appearance. Mm -hmm. And right now, for example, probably many of your listeners are familiar with the exophenotype of the gray. Right. You know, it's, you've seen them pictures of them or representations of them. And the gray, there are 100, over 150 known species of grays. Wow. And the gray, you see, each species in a way is how higher intelligence manifests itself in a particular form. In other words, we humans, earthling humans, are how intelligence manifests itself in a primate form. Right, okay. And the gray species are, roughly speaking, how the plant kingdom manifests itself, how intelligence manifests itself in in the plant form. Yeah, I, I thought this was so interesting because you have in the book uh, a dialogue where a gray alien from what was called the Exobiology Project in 2006, the gray says that they are nocturnal and they use chlorophyll as a vital nutrient source. And that's, I guess that's what we're getting at here. Yeah, chlorophyll and there's a lot of copper in there. So they're sort of like intelligent plants. I mean, you know, more or less, uh, if, if people want to know, oh, well, why do they look so weird? Well, they're not insectoids. They're not intelligent bugs. They're not reptilian. They're not intelligent reptiles. They're not humanoids. They're the grays. Actually, you should call them plantoids. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's so weird. Um, before this book, I hadn't really thought of them that way. But I was also surprised to see like the subclasses. There's you know the standard ones we probably see in media, but there's also tall grays that have reproductive organs that when other ones, all those smaller ones don't seem to. Yeah, there's over 150 categories. There, there are actually five main types. The standard grays are the most common type. They're about four to four and a half feet tall. They have large bulbous heads, wraparound eyes, a slit like mouth, small ears without earlobes, no visible nose. Their legs are shorter and jointed differently than one would expect in a human. Their arms often reach down to their knees. 
Uh, they can be gray, white, pale blue, pale green, pale orange, brown. Some have hands with fingers, some have claws, some have webs. The tall grays are six to nine feet tall. They have a distinct nose. That is the tall nose grays. The tall grays are six to seven feet tall. And they are basically taller versions of the standard grays. And uh, some of them have reproductive organs. The short grays are three and a half feet tall. Some of them can be aggressive. Some of the, uh, for example, the Orion-based grays are said to be in alliance with some of the more aggressive and territorial reptilians, the Draco reptilians. Mm. And there's some mini grays that are said to be two feet tall. Wow. Although the, some entities are great hyperdimensionals, some of them may be artificial cyborgs or probes. For example, there's some researchers that have stated and have found that there's a program called the Military Abduction Program, which is a program that human military intelligence has devised to mimic ET abductions so that humans would think that they're being abducted by extraterrestrial species. And the intelligence agencies have this, the military agencies have this for a number of purposes. One is to try and get intelligence from people who have been abducted by by the greys, because then they debrief them. And the other is to kind of give the extraterrestrials a reputation because, you know, they can do certain things to them. And they have engineered what are called biological life forms or artificial cyborgs that look like greys that then they use to, quote, abduct these humans. This is the real shadow work. (laughs) (laughs) Right, man. Right. Jesus. We got a lot to deal with. Yeah. This is so interesting, man, and I'm glad that someone's out there profiling these creatures. And I had mentioned that a lot of this information came out of the Exobiology Project in 2006, and apparently there was also an interview with a reptilian who gave details about their species also. I was curious where this information came from. Do you know what type of project that was exactly? Well, these are reports from the the Exobiology Project that a very forward-thinking the head of Exopolitics, Exopolitics South Africa, Professor Manuel Lamelroy, then has compiled in an encyclopedia the exophino typology of these based on a number of projects, one of which was the Exobiology Project. And there are a number of databases, including the Exobiology Project, that are ongoing. And there are other projects that he's just getting to now. There's a lot of data that exists that have not even yet been processed. So what I've done in this volume, kind of at the wholesale level, I've taken the fruit of the vineyards of what scholars like Professor Lamaroy have done and then put them within a larger model, which is the dimensional ecology model which shows how exophenotypes work within the model of the larger dimensional ecology. Right on, yeah. Man, there's just I get, it's so interesting because a lot of people are just in the dark about this subject and then they hear that there's so much data that the people who are really working on it are having to sift through it and they don't even have the time in the day. But Alfred, this has been fascinating stuff. I loved your book. <laughs> I'm always checking out the interesting stuff on exopolitics.com. And Thank you. You got it. Thank you. And would you like to tell the people a little bit more about the other stuff you have going on or what you're working on in the future before we go? Sure, sure. I, I'd like to mention one project in particular, and that is the 9-11 War Crimes Tribunal. And... Uh, This was initiated in June of 2012, and we've heard 20 witnesses. You can go to 911warcrimestribunal.org together with my fellow judge, 
Constance Fogel, a, a uh, very preeminent lawyer here in Canada, and Professor Jim Fetzer of the University of Wisconsin. We're a tribunal of conscience. We'll be issu- issuing an opinion, verdicts, and sentences later on this year for the war crimes and genocide involved in the false flag operation of September 11, 2001, and its aftermath, including the genocides in Afghanistan and Iraq, the genocidal war on terror, and all of the damages caused by the New World Order's police state, domestic police state worldwide, under principles of restorative 